Okay, we're continuing in Sefer Shmuel, Perik Yud Dalid, Pasuk Yud Gimel. And we're at the point where Yonasan is taking his arms bearer with him, and he makes a nachash. He makes a kind of a prediction uh, based on the response that he gets from the plishtim. He said to his arms bearer, the plishtim, as you recall, he secretly snuck out of the camp of Shaul with his arms bearer. And he said to his arms bearer, if they say to us, stop until we get to you, then we shouldn't go. It's not a good idea to fight. But if they say, come up to us, then we'll know that Hashem gave them into our hands. So he had a whole discussion of the Gomorrah that, saying, that said, any, anyone who does a nachash, anyone who does these kinds of uh, prognostications, uh, where the Torah says it's prohibited, it has to be the type of, of nachash like Eliezer and Yonason. So we went through already um, last week, the last time we met with the Radak's commentary at great length. Still wanted to bring out the Musa Navim that says one more important point to add on to what the Radak said. And he says that that which the Torah prohibits when it's not allowed to do that kind of fortune telling. It's only when you do it in a way like Eliezer and Yonason did. Meaning to say, if you totally rely on it like Eliezer and Yonason totally relied on it. If you rely, you say, if a black cat comes along, I totally rely on it that it's a bad sign we shouldn't do anything. So if just like Eliezer and Yonason totally relied on the sign that they did, because they acted totally upon it, so if someone wants to prognosticate through certain things happening and looks for bad omens as it were if they totally believe in the bad omen that's prohibited so now the question is so why was Eliezer and Yonasan allowed to do it the answer is according to now we already gave it the answer from the Radak last week but what the uh, the, uh, the Musra Navim adds from the, he brings from the Kesef Mishnah on the Rambam he says that with that which Eliezer and Yonasan did was a logical prediction for example, when Eliezer said, well, if I come down here and the woman who draws water for me and for my camels will be for Yitzchak, that's not just an omen and a sign, but that is really based on what he's looking for. He's looking for the right shidduch. So what's going to be the right shidduch? It did, he didn't say a woman who comes to the well and does three somersaults and a cartwheel, that'll be the one that'll be for Yitzchak. He says the one that will show a true act of kindness, that'll be the one for Yitzchak. So that is very logical, and that's what you're looking for, although it would be unusual to find that in Choron, a place that was the opposite of kindness, and that's almost asking for a miracle, but it's more than that. It's what is what is required, and that is what would be a clear indication that that is exactly what he is looking for. And same thing with Yonasan, that if they would say to us, go up, so that surely shows... Uh, that that uh, that they're not afraid, and and that's a good nichush to have. Uh, he says similarly. Whatever a guy says, you know, if it's going to rain a lot today, we're not going to go on our trip today. Is that a nachash? No. If it's raining, it means it's bad weather. It's not a good idea to go on the trip. So if it doesn't rain, we will go on the trip because that means it's good weather to go on the trip. So therefore, we means nichush means if you rely on it to the extent that Eliezer. And Jonas relied on it, even though what they did was permitted. But when you do it in a not permitted way and rely on it as much as they did, that's when it's not allowed. Right? So we have now two shot. The Radak says that you're investing um, uh, uh, powers into this uh, cat or whatever, as opposed to just looking at it as a sign from Hashem. And more than that, you believe in that power as clearly as Eliezer and um, Yonason believed in the permitted way of doing it. If you believe in a prohibited way in the same way, then that is prohibited. If you only say, well, I don't know, I saw a black cat. It's not that I totally believe in the black cat. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I still do it. Then that wouldn't be awesome. But if you totally act on it 100% and live your life by that fortune telling, then that would totally not be allowed. Okay. So now we continue back into the story. Pasuk Yud. Um, one second. Yud Gimel. Yeah. So Yonasan decide they go up on their hands and feet. 
and his arms bear goes with him by Yiplu Lifne Yonason Venaise Caleb Mimosis Akarov. And they fell before Yonason, the the um police the troops fell before Yonas and is able to kill them, and his arms bear kills them after them. Now the Mavlin explains how this happened, uh of oh it was all miraculous, but it has to be a little bit cloaked within the normal things. If you remember we said there was a very huge precipice um, that was on the edge before you came to the Plishti camp. So the Plishti saw him at the bottom of the precipice and said, come on up. So they were sure that the way he would come up would be going around the precipice and going up around the precipice. So they were waiting for him on the other side of the precipice, around the pathway. They were waiting for this. What Hashem helped him miraculously is he climbed right over the precipice, which was a dangerous climb, and he deftly climbed over it. And now, while the army is looking for him at the on the trail around the precipice, he and so let, let's say it's a, it's a huge precipice, huge. I don't know how big it is. A huge precipice. So the army's you know going down the pathway to one side of the precipice, right? Jonas is coming up the top so when he comes down he, the, the, the beginning part of the army the garrison isn't seeing him at all so he's getting a place to schleppers in the back the guys in the back aren't ready for any attacking right away they know the guys in the front are going to do any attacking so now he comes and he surprises the guys in the middle okay so that's that's what's going on over here um one second okay so that's why he's able to kill them because he, he's t- catching them off guard. By tehi hamaka pasuk yudal. By tehi hamaka harishona asher hika yoynes and v'nayse kelav keesrim ish. The first uh, hitting that they were able to Jonas and his arms were able to kill was about twenty people. Manet semet sada was the length of a half a furrow's length when plowing a field. Again, I don't know why the Torah has to mention that specific amount to us, that uh, amount of space, whatever. But uh, clearly, this was all part of, of the miraculous nature that he was able to get the unsuspecting people. And this creates already a tumult. And this is where the key to victory lies. Test of basada. There was a charada, a fear, overcame the camp in the field, uvacholam and all the nation. Hamatzav Amashchis, the garrison and the Mashchis. The Mashchis is the uh, like the, the front troops that are meant uh, to destroy. I believe um, Rav, Rav Sadj uh, over here explains it in a Matzav and a Mashchis. Different military terms over here, just to be precise here. Uh, Rav Shaya rather says the Matzav is a, a gathering of troops, and the Mashchis are the Giborim who are ready to fight. In other words, the matzah is the garrison. It's a collection of troops. The mashkis are, are the ones who are, re- are going to fight this minute. So I don't know what military terms you use for the ones who are ready to fight immediately. Literally, mashkis means destroyers. Active garrison or reserve garrison. Whatever, something like that. So, uh, so, so that's uh, where, where he's able to... There's a tumult involving everybody there. Um... And uh, so certainly, you know, had what the Malvin explains, had the had had Jonasson attacked them frontally, you know, just taken the path and attacked them frontally, there wouldn't have been any any scare. They said, ah, oh, there's two guys. So maybe they killed a few people, but they saw what was happening. So there's two guys. They killed a few guys. Okay, well we'll get these two guys. But now all of a sudden, you're in the front. You don't know where Jonasson went. All of a sudden, in the back, you're hearing people getting killed. And you don't know that it's only two guys. It could be it's a whole ambush. You have no idea what's going on. So it's caused a tremendous tumult over here for the whole nation. They all were afraid. So the whole land, in other words, the earth, all, all the people uh, of this place were afraid. And it wasn't just a regular natural fear since the Malbim, but it was a fear that Hashem put into them. Hashem put a supernatural fear into them that caused all this. So this already, it's already causing a great tumult. And this does not go unnoticed by Shaul and his scouts who are looking from the other side. Pasuk Tesayin. Vayiru hatsofim l'shaul. And those scouts of Shaul see what's going on. The Giva's binyamin in the, in the Giva of binyamin. 
and behold, it's a surprise. The masses of pollution, the mug, they've melted away. By they've gone and they're confused, they're confounded. In other words, when you see these troops in a battle formation, and it looks like they're ready for battle, as they were up to that point, it looked like they were prepared. But all of a sudden, some people are, are killed, others are scared. This one's hearing clashing, this one's running, this one's noisy, this one's back and forth. There's this disarray. So they see that there's a tremendous melting of the hearts of the police team. And at that point, Pasuk Yitzayin, Vayoymer Shol Sher Ito. So Shol speaks to the people who are with him. Remember, he only has how many soldiers? 600. Good. He says, Pik Dunaru, let's, let's count up the troops and see. Mihi Lach Meimanu, who, who has left from us? In other words, he, 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 the Malbim explains, says, what's going on? that all of a sudden the, the police, the troops are all confused over there, right? Must be somebody caused this to happen. So let's see who, who's gone, right? So they counted, they counted, they see the Yonah son and his arms bear are not there. And uh, even though that happened, he says that's very unusual that two people should create such a tumult like this. Very unusual. So Yudches, Vayomer Shol so Shaul speaks to Achia. Remember he said Achia was a descendant of Eli, who was the Kohen, and probably the Kohen Godel. He says, Agisha, Aaron, Elohim, bring the, bring the, uh, the Ark of God together with the Urim Vitumim. Uh, and he's saying, Ki hoya Aaron, Elohim, uh, hu, Yisrael. And because the Ark of God on that day was with the Jewish people. So uh, the Malmah explains, he wants he want to bring the ark and therefore ask from the Urim Vatum from the breastplate, what's the reason for this tumult? What's going on? Something's very unusual. Is this a sign for us to go to battle or not? And the Pusik uh, just parenthetically says, because from the time of the destruction of Shiloh, the Ur never had a set place. And when they coronated uh, Shul from that time on, uh, uh, um, in other words, they would take the Aaron with them in important events whenever they gathered together when they were at Gilgal to renew the kingship the Ark was there and the Ark was still with them so it's at Baal so they're saying so let's the Ark is here bring the Ark close you'll ask from Hashem I guess you had to ask the Urim in the proximity of the Ark of the Kiddush over there so ask and let me know what's going on so you test and it was even before Shol could speak to the Kohen and, and the masses of the Pleishtim, they're going all over the place. Gather in your hands, meaning to say, you know, we ain't got time. It, it, it's too obvious what I have to be doing over here. There, there's such a, a tumult going amongst the Pleishtim over there. And, and, and he could hear, you know, and probably, you know, Pleishtim, you know, you don't know, you don't know what's going on. You get scared. Just everybody's, you know, remember, most it's not like the Israeli army where you care about the, the person next to you and you do what you can to save their lives. The non-Jewish armies, especially in those days, you have a man for himself. So who knows who's killing who? Just make sure one thing, kill the guy next to you and you will be alive. So in all that confusion, right? And these mercenaries, who knows? You don't even know who your friends are. You don't know who will turn on you, as you'll see even in this story. So, you know, so Shaul sees what's going on, says, no time to ask any questions. Let's just immediately act. Cough. And uh, Shaul gathers up. Vayis uh, Shaul, and 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 Shaul gathers up. Vachol Amisher Ito and all the nation that's with him. Vayevad and Melchama they come into the battlefield. Vinei Hay Sacher of Ish Bereu Muma Gadola. And what was going on? Each Plishti was driving a sword into his other friend because this great confusion Mao that was a very great confusion. So the pasuk begins to give three reasons why Shaul is victorious in battle. Number one, because this great confusion and the Plishtim were killing themselves. Next, Pasach of Aleph. For Ivrim Hayula Plishtim Kaesmol Shulshom Asher Olu Imam Bamachan Esaviv. And there were also Ivrim. Again, we're mentioning the word Ivrim referring to Jews. And it would appear that there were Jews who were turncoats. They were collaborators with the Plishtim. Not necessarily because they wanted to, but it says these Jews were with the policemen from yesterday and the day before, which were in the camp around them. And uh, the Malbim explains that the policemen probably, you know, those, I guess there were Jews who were afraid of their lives. 
and they probably helped out the police chief in terms of, you know, they, I'm sure they wouldn't go out to battle to kill Jews, but the police chief, you need those uh, supply lines and things like that. So he kind of, you know, they said to those Jews, we're afraid, listen, we won't kill you, just, you know, make sure you bring the supplies and all the secondary stuff that's necessary. So to all those Jews over there, uh, so they too now turn to the Jewish people so now we have a group from within the police de camp and for all you know we can uh, speculate that maybe the police said if you're running the supply lines maybe we'll even give you a sword could be so or whatever but be that as it may from within the police de camp besides the confusion and when the Jews saw the confusion uh, so clearly those Jews now change sides to be with the, with the Jews. And now Pasach Hafez says a third group. And all the Jews who were hiding in the mountains of Ephraim, they heard about that the police were running away. So they also attached themselves to the battle. So Shaul, aside from his 600 men, has got police them killing themselves. He's got the Jews who now had sided with the police team are turning against the police team and the Jews who were hiding were afraid of turning against the police team. All of a sudden you have a lot of people. And therefore through all these groups over here One second, I have a red dock over here. One second. Yeah, that's what the, I just, uh, as I said, the mom didn't say that specifically but the, the, the red dock said that there were Jews against their will even the red dock says that these Jewish turncoats val korcham lilachem yisrael against their will they had to fight against the Jews, right? Um, and they were around the camp, okay, uh, and trying to maybe you know run away and not have to have to go to the battle. In other words, it seems that the Egyptians uh, that the uh, police forced certain Jews to fight for them. So I guess those Jews didn't want to take the front lines. They were around the sides and they'd see what would happen. Either they could run away or whatever, but now that they saw the Jews were winning, so now they went back on the Jewish side. Uh, okay, that's enough. Fine. All right, so because of all that, Hashem saved the Jewish people on this day. And the battle passed on, kept going until a place called Base Oven. So obviously what the Pesach is emphasizing is don't think it's all natural great talent on the military uh, prowess of the Jewish people. It's saying by Yosha Hashem by Yomu. It's Hashem who saved them. Right? Now the battle is going to a place called Beis Oven. So now there was like a lull in the battle because uh, the monks were being chased after were spreading about uh, and it really was all miraculous. It wasn't their ability to fight. So now there's a lull in the battle. Please are running away. So now, what happens during the lull? So we're now on Pasuk of Da'ol. And the Jewish people were still pressing on that day. In other words, uh, Shaul saw that the people had stopped uh, for this little lull. And therefore, uh, and so the Mom explains interesting why there was a lull in the battle. He says, this wasn't a battle that Jews ever wanted to fight. He says, uh, since Hashol, they were kind of pressed into battle, they had to fight against their will. The police were massing armies against them. It's not like sometimes you go to a battle, it's an important battle, we want to fight the battle, we're looking to expand our borders, whatever. And so it says, listen, we're pressed, we really didn't want to fight. Remember, they don't have uh, swords, right? So, so they were kind of forced into this. So as soon as there's relief, and the enemy is not is running away, so that now there's a lull, so why should we continue with the fight? So therefore, they, they weren't inclined to continue. So as soon as they have their first break, they stop. So Shaul wasn't happy with that. Shaul wanted them to press on. So what does he do? Continuing in the Pasuk. Yoel Shaul Esha'ab. And Shaul made the nation square, lay more say. Or ha'ish asher yochalechem at ha'arev. Cursed will be any man who eats bread until evening. And until what? And I take revenge for my enemies. So Shaul now invokes unilaterally as by being the king a fast. Now the question is, you know, were, were they not fasting already? So the Malam discusses this and he said he made a fast that they shouldn't eat 
any bread so they can uh, finish off the enemies and the Malma says and most likely they already were fasting because whenever Jews were in a state of calamity and would go to battle that was just the traditional way you go to battle you fast so that wouldn't be anything new but uh, but now that they've been saved right so now he makes a, a vow um, so, so uh, he makes a decree that they still can't eat even though you could say the battle's over there's already a law the, the, the police team are, are running away but, but since Saul felt it wasn't a complete salvation until we totally destroy them so therefore he says you know and, not, and don't think that you know we, we're fasting now and now we can stop fasting he said no the fast will continue and I am continuing it and he says it's cursed is the one who will eat any bread so now the, the problem is not clear exactly how far reaching was this uh, edict that Saul invoked there's one swear to say that all he did was say, look what he says. He said, curse the person who eats bread. What do you mean bread? Why say you bread? Just say eat. So he's saying bread because that would imply a proper meal. In other words, anyone who says, sit down, we have a full meal, it's going to take time now. You have to slaughter animals and, you know, uh, shech the animal, salt the blood, and start cooking and this makes a whole big deal over there. So it could be, no, maybe, maybe he only, um, so he prohibited that bread and all that things but just have a little taste right or something that isn't bread maybe just a little fruit uh, so maybe that would be okay you might think that that would be okay but he says until we revenge from the enemies so uh, so, so you could say that that's the problem don't spend a lot of time preparing a meal so if you're spending a lot of time a meal that will prevent you from running after the enemies but that might not preclude a small thing to taste that's on the one end just on the other hand you could say no maybe the decree was to eat anything that through the suffering that the self affliction they're having and the tshuva will help them to totally take revenge against the enemies so so it, it's, it's not clear did he mean they shouldn't have a full meal they shouldn't even taste whatever so what do we see from the Jews so the end of the passage says Velo tam kol am lochem. the Jewish people did not eat any bread uh, so they didn't they didn't have a full meal and they also didn't even taste anything as well how do we see this in the next pasuk next to pasuk in Chafav V'chala Oretz Bal Bayar literally the word Oretz means the land so the Mephorsh is saying the land means the Am Haaretz even the, 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 the lowest people the Amaratz the, the men, people of the land the, the uneducated so all the Jews they came Bal Bayar they come to this forest and there's honey all over this the field of the forest so the, the commentators discuss where is this honey coming from Rashi says there was a grove of sugar canes and from the sugar canes was dripping out honey the Rabag says it there were honeycombs from bees and they were laid out all over the place uh, other verse says as well it's interesting that nobody says that what would be the most obvious shot where, what would you assume honey would be from date, date palms date honey nobody says there's any date honey over there I don't know why maybe because it felt it was a yard maybe in a field uh, in a forest you don't have uh, palm trees could be I don't know but anyway there was a lot of honey flowing all over the place that's and that would be a very easy quick thing just scoop up a little bit of honey and go on go on with your battle no the people came to the forest and the, and the, and the, and the honey is flowing but they masig yodo alpif. Nobody reached his hand out to his mouth. Kiorehah amis ashvu, because people were afraid of the oath. So we see from this pasuk that even a little taste they didn't even have, because they were afraid of the oath. In other words, in other words, when, when Shaul said what he said, the people weren't sure exactly what he meant. Did he mean a full meal? Did he mean even a little taste? So it says, first of all, they didn't eat any bread. They didn't sit down to have any meal. And they continued chasing. And even now is the opportunity of even a little taste. And maybe Shaul would have allowed a little taste. It's not clear from his oath. But the people were all machmer on themselves. They were all stringent on themselves not to even have a little bit of that taste. So Jews wanted to continue and press on with this battle. And, to fulfill. and you could imagine they were quite fatigued. You know, you, you watch these football players, it's hockey players, like every minute there's a break, they're pushing Gatorade and all these uh, uh, high energy drinks, you know, in, in between plays, you know, where their lives aren't even on the line, 
right? And here the Jews are fasting a whole day, they're running and chasing, and you can imagine what, what pressure's on. Even a chance to scoop up a little bit of honey, they don't take any of that. So they're all into this. Okay, now comes an important event. Chavzayim. The Yainah's son, now who would not have heard this oath that Shaul made? Yainah's son and his arms bare. Because Yonah's son was on the other side, he was in the middle of the police team, who knows where he was. Eventually, he probably caught up with the Jews at one point in time. Chavzayim, the Yainah's son lo shama b'hashbiya avi v'sa'am. Yonason did not hear when his father invoked this oath upon the people. So he, he, he sends the edge of his staff that's in his hand. He dips it into the honey. And he puts a little bit of his hand of it, his hand to his mouth. And literally means his eyes illuminated. Meaning to say, he was very fatigued, he was very hungry, and he was like almost ready to pass out. He was ready to pass out. So he took a little, a little honey, just like almost, uh, you know, anybody wants to pass out, a little honey, a little sugar, get a sugar rush. To, to give and he was like, Mamish revived. It's Mamish revived. So now the Pasuk is showing us a whole bunch of reasons right at this point in the game where even though we're going to see in a minute Yonason gets discovered that he ate but there's many reasons to say he had a good excuse for what he did number one what he didn't hear what his father said so he was a show geek. he didn't even know number two he only took a little taste and that itself people weren't even sure if that was the degree of what Shoal said he didn't have a meal just took a little just to refresh himself for maybe a five seconds and more than that his eyes illuminated because he probably, you know, by the fact that his eyes, I don't know, I guess when you get to certain uh, points of dehydration or hunger, you know, your eyes... Uh, Dog, sunken. So whatever, the eyes turn a certain way. So his mom is starving. And this is mom is pikuach nefesh, because his life was in danger. Right? Certainly, even if you make an oath, even on Yom Kippur, if someone is deathly ill, they could eat a little, a little something. He probably even had less than a kazai. He probably didn't have a shear. A shear achila, not even a minimum amount of achila. And was to save his life. So you already see in this situation, there's ample reason to when he will be found out to excuse this behavior. That's what the Puskas is telling us. Yeah, Rafal? I recall hearing that in the Yom Kippur War, the rabbi said that those soldiers who maintained their fast actually did something wrong, that, that they should have eaten the rather than fast, they should have, uh, uh, like, it's not even like, a, like he had an excuse not to, but he really should have been. Okay, we can't compare the Yom Kippur War to the battles that the Jews fought in the times of the Shoftim and Shmuel Novi. You're talking about battles when we had an ark, you had Urim Vatumim, the love of Kedusha was infinitely greater than exists today. So they're not on a level. The soldiers are not on a level uh, to do the kind of... It's not the same kind of wars that Hashem is fighting our wars then as He does today. It's all... Everything Hashem does now is so shrouded um, and veiled that we have to fight the wars more according to nature. When Shaul and the Jews were fighting, they were fighting and Mamish knew Hashem, and Mamish knew Hashem was with them. You understand? No, no. Remember those days, no one was a soldier unless he was a tzaddik. But, but I, you had to be a tzaddik to fight in the Jewish army, right? Remember this. Oh, the Chumash says anybody even talked between the couldn't, couldn't. The littlest of air, you can't. It was clearly when Jews fought, it was overt, obvious. Either you were fighting with Hashem or you weren't fighting with Hashem. Shaul was the king. Now you're fighting with Hashem. You're fighting with Hashem. It's not, and, and they had no swords. <laughs> Let's remember what's going on over here. You have no swords. You know it's not, it's not even a, sh a doubt. It's completely Hashem saving you. So that means this is totally a spiritual war. And there is only one thing that will help you. Stay a tzaddik. And that's the only means of victory. So that soul made an oath. Nobody could eat. It's got to mamish be totally miraculous. 
not to take anything away from the courage of the Israeli soldiers in this but we are not talking about overt miracles of the level that the Jewish people would have when Shaul and David Amelech are fighting we're not talking about soldiers uh, without a veros every single soldier not one soldier that fights today would have fought at all for David or, 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 or Shaul Amelech because here's a one Jew who hasn't done a veros they will not be eligible <laughs> forget it so now you have to work totally totally according to nature according to nature you have to eat in order to be to, to fight right? of course Hashem is still veiled and he's there we're not saying Hashem isn't there it's miraculous their victories but no way did the Jews win any of their wars without even a rifle at least they had a rifle <laughs> right but uh, here they had not even one sword Right? clearly Hashem was doing so so you're totally going on, a, on a, a supernatural level the wars we fight today have to be fought totally naturally you dive into Hashem but here Hashem is only helping us in a veiled way so therefore you have to act in a normal way normal way means you have to eat ok so the rabbis could say they're supposed to eat when they're fighting well because they, you need more of the natural part of you to be involved in the victory here there was totally nothing natural part involved with victories. That's where it clearly would be a difference. Because every Jewish, you'd ask the question on every Jewish war, every Jewish war Jews ever fought, they always fasted. So why, why now different? Because we're not on that level. We're, we're not fighting the wars the way the Jews fought the wars in those days. Yeah? I understand that explanation. How do, you, how do we explain that Sadiqim, who it says were with the Kalishti previously and now, how do we explain that those same Sadiqim it could be maybe they weren't it could be a that those weren't Sadiqim and they weren't with they weren't with Shaul at the end of the day Shaul only had 600 guys but even at best he only had a garrison of 3,000 that was right so it could be, could be they weren't Sadiqim and, and they were taking they should take other people and they grab people as uh, their, 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 their what do you call it their uh, kidnapping people and all kinds of things. See the Arabs do it all the time to try to kidnap soldiers. So it's that huge armies. And could be could be Jews who were scared just voluntarily went to the policemen as well. Obviously these weren't the greatest that they even, doesn't mean to say that others weren't involved in the fighting, couldn't turn them away. Uh, but uh, they weren't part of his unit. His unit of six hundred were still the Sadiq, clearly. Uh, and then the others joined in. And, and or and you could maybe also say even if someone's a tzaddik you know what, one of the three things uh, one of the four things you go back from the front lines is you're afraid you know some of them maybe thought they were tzaddikim there are a lot of people who think they're tzaddikim right so listen you know even, uh, even the Torah says that the coin would come to the battle line and say he who he who just got engaged he who did this he was afraid afraid of his affairs you know the question is so what are you doing at the battle line to begin with I mean everybody read the Chumash any, any soldier learned Sefer Dvorah it says anybody who's afraid shouldn't go so who, why, is he, why is he at the battlefield now the answer is he thought he was a tzaddik a lot of people think they're tzaddikim really all of a sudden you see the end you're right at there's a big difference between being a tzaddik in theory and being a tzaddik on the battlefield all of a sudden you're at the battlefield the police are right it's not that you were back in your shul and they called you up as a reserve now you're at the battlefield right across the ridge of the police ship look there's 30,000 police ship with this and that all of a sudden you know you start excuse the expression you know you, 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 your bowels are loose right and, and all of a sudden you realize you know I don't know if I'm such a big tzaddik <laughs> you know what please them you know uh, maybe I'll join the police you sign I was later tzaddik then they who really is a tzaddik be that as it may Yonah's son clearly you know violated it but clearly had a number of legitimate excuses that could come into play as we'll see later on in the story now we see over here that Yonah's son must have been with the other troops and didn't know what's going on because now you see in Pasuk Chavches Vayan Ish Meha'am one of the people from the, na- from the p- nation Jewish people responded to what he did Vayom he said Hashpe Hashpe Avich Ha'am Ha'am lay more your father made an oath Or Ish Asher Yoch Alech Ha'am curse is the man who eats bread today Vayom Ha'am and the people are fatigued 
And the Malam explains that this person was rebuking Yonah's son. Um, that he was saying, because, well, you might have thought, because, again, how did the people interpret um, Shoal's uh, oath? Not to even taste anything. Now, it's interesting. He, he said, your father said, no, he just repeated what Shoal said. Your father said, anyway, he's bread today. So you could have thought maybe only bread, but not a little bit of food might have been okay. But then it says, but the, but the people are all fatigued. How could everybody be fatigued? I mean, they didn't even take any little sugar rushes. So he was saying, you see, we've all accepted for ourselves not to touch anything. How are you coming and touching anything? So this is classic, classic. What, what, is, what is emerging over here? And this will now explain. We'll see tomorrow. We're going to see what's emerging. What, no, no, a typical... Um, negative people, how do they analyze this situation? The king made a decree, the kid doesn't listen to it. How would negative people react to this situation? There's two ways to look at the situation. Judging favorably and judging not favorably. Okay? So what would the person judging favorably say? You probably didn't hear what was going on, this and that. What is he saying? You know, your father made an oath. Well, I guess uh, I guess family doesn't have to follow the rules. Right? That, that you see is going to be one of the underlining issues over here. Right? So, uh, notwithstanding what what Yoinison did, you know, and a number of factors, so you see that you'll see it tomorrow. There's there's different groups over here, but this guy, you know, was commenting and saying, "Listen, your father said, and see, and we all are being very strict. We're not eating anything, and now you're eating something." Now the response of Yonasan is quite intriguing. Pasuk of Tess. Vayoymer Yonasan. Yonasan's response. Now you hear what should his response have been? Either he said, oh I didn't know. I didn't know. That would seem to be a simpler son. It's not his response. Vayoymer Yonasan. Ochar of the S.O.R.S. My father has damaged the land. Meaning damaged the soldiers. In other words, he's being critical of what his father is doing over here. So a whole number of interpretations over here of what he did wrong over here. But, uh, but he's saying he, he has damaged the people. Runa, take a look. Ki oru enai. Look, my eyes have, have illuminated. Ki ta'amti And I took only a little bit of honey. So, first of all, what Yonasan is saying is the decree itself, you know, first of all, first of all, first of all he didn't know about it. Okay, that, that, that's clear. But he also says, Ochara v. S.O.R.S. My father has damaged the people. It was not a good decree. Lushenhar? No, not Lushenhar. He's criticized. Not Lushenhar. He's criticized. Lushenhar is, is, is saying something bad about it. So I think my father made a mistake. That's not Lushenhar. It's criticism. That's also not nice. It's not keep it up. Lushenhar it isn't. But it, it's criticism against the king, his father. Okay? Now certainly he meant well. He says, he says, listen, you know, you see my eyes just illuminated? You know, I was really not well. I was really not well. And, uh, uh, and uh, now, so I think from the mom also seems to be saying that, that he, he didn't know ab about the decree. So that's why he's created a damage because if, if people didn't know about it, so it's creating a damage. And B, look, look that I have an excuse. I, I felt a lot, of, a lot better. And he says, and he says, better, he says, and, and, and look, he said, I don't think the decree was even a good idea. And this is where Rafal's idea would come in over here. He says, look how much better I feel. Can you imagine if all the soldiers would have had a little bit? you think they, they would have fought a lot better. He says in Pasuk Lamed, And you know what? If the people would have eaten the, the loot, the loot, the booty, of the police ship, and they really would have eaten a lot, I sure must have should have found. Can you imagine, in other words, if I just had a little bit of honey, and I already feel so much better, can you imagine if the whole people would have, would have looted the police ship, had some good food, yummy food, had a good meal? Don't you think it would be a much bigger hit against the police ship? Right. We could have done a more amazing job than we did right now. So, so Malcolm says, so, you know, this, this was a number of things wrong. You know, and first of all, he didn't investigate the whole situation that was going on over here. He's criticizing his father. But more importantly, he doesn't allow the miracle, the battle, to be a completely miraculous for Hashem. 
if this is mamish a miracle from it, listen, you already saw you're able to climb that, that precipice with no problem. You're able to cause a tremendous um, fear. And you, obviously it's a fear of Hashem. And you yourself said it, if Hashem will show us a sign. So you understand it's all a godly battle over here. And your father said nobody should eat to make it totally a godly battle. Now all of a sudden you're putting in a little bit of, of, of your own normal teva over here. We should eat. See, I felt a little bit better. If everybody also feel a little better. So it's kind of saying that we don't really, he's not totally, again, it's a tzaddik on his level. And we've got to remember, the guy was starving. It was his thumb. He just wants to have a, a candy bar. Like he was starving. He says, you see it helps. I'm mamish feel better. And he mamish all meant l'shem shemayim. But to a certain degree, he is saying, you know, it doesn't have to totally be miraculous from Hashem. And that is where the criticism will come to him over here. The Robag um, as well says, um, uh, oh, so the Robag is giving all these reasons uh, that he says because of, because uh, uh, we're going to see like, you know, why are people so criti uh, critical about Jonasson over here? And for all these reasons that, that, that he's giving over, that he doesn't want to allow the uh, miraculous nature of Hashem. And more than that, he's saying that my father has damaged things, right? Things could have been a lot better. So, again, for somebody like Jonasson, this was definitely a negative thing to do, his comment. And ultimately, when we look down the line, when Jonasson dies in battle, you have to come back to this incident. And again, you have to realize, you know, where is he doing this sin? Not from a position of calm, relaxed, a situation came to him, he had time to think it over. I mean, you can imagine what his uh, adrenaline was going through at this time. He's running and this, and just scooping a little honey, and they're criticizing him. And this probably was, was a reaction, not a well thought out reaction. You got to look at everything in the context over here. You're fighting for your life, and everything's going on. And, and they say, "Hey, you know, your father said you can't eat it. What's going on? Playing favorites, this and that." So you know, I, I don't know what's going on. Really, uh, but you know, so you let's check things out a little more. And it's criticizing his father. So then all of a sudden, these things fall. So you see, it takes a lot to get excited like you're innocent to make a mistake, right? But it's still a mistake. It was. And we'll see tomorrow how the people react to uh, all that happens over there. All right.